Hello everyone who has signed up. Uh, welcome to this fourth series of IESA, uh, the interview series A Way to Learn, where we, will, where we are speaking with people from all over the world, uh, innovators in the field of education, which is in the workplace, in the classroom, or in the digital space. Uh, my name is Mark Sosner from IESE Business School and uh, this event was, uh, you would expect Giuseppe Auricchio, he cannot be here, but uh, he's my colleague and I'm very happy to be with you and to interview David Blake, who is the co-founder and the CEO of uh, Degreed. He's in the US and uh, I'm very grateful to you. And uh, we have seen and uh, recognized we have people from all over the world uh, signed up from Madagascar to uh, the US to, to Russia to the Philippines and very close uh, sieges and Barcelona. So thank you very much uh, to, to join us here. Uh, and uh, I can promise you it will be a very engaging and uh, interesting interview. So David, you are the main person here uh, that we want to learn from. And so can you share a little bit with us uh, how you have learned in the past, how have you have uh, come to found the company and give us a little bit of a vision of uh, where you see education heading. And then we will go into the details of talking about individual learning, corporate learning and where the industry is heading in general. So I hand it over to you for the first, okay. uh, the first introduction. Uh -huh. I, I could take a, a long time on any one of those topics, so uh, see how quickly I can and knock them all out. Um, my personal learning journey, you know, sort of the starting of Degreed, and uh, I'll, I'll take it that far, but, you know, my personal story around education, I think, you know, education is one of those unifying things uh, across the world. Everyone has sort of, you know, their story and uh, about their education, and for me, um, this passion snuck up on me. I was always a very dedicated student and always a very um, uh, good student. And it was when I took my university entrance exams that this sort of bit me. And for me, I, I scored very well, but the experience was just so absurd to me. You know, I had, I had given so much of myself to my, sort of my studies and my academics and, uh, and yet sort of this three hour test on a Saturday when I was 17 was half of the equation for what university I would get into. And that was, you know, that's sort of half of the equation for what job I might have available to me, you know, coming out of school. And that's half of the equation for sort of my early career trajectory. And here I am, 17, and I don't know what I want to be. I don't know what I want to do. This test doesn't reflect who I am. It doesn't reflect what I know, and yet it's so much of sort of my future. And, and that really just didn't sit well with me. And so that's what first sort of catalyzed all this, was I, I then started studying high-stakes testing and where did it come from and how predictive is it. And then really what cemented it for me was this sort of dawning realization that while I had been an exceptional student, I realized that these books I was reading, it was the first thing I had ever really studied mm -hmm. that a teacher hadn't assigned to. Mm -hmm. And I had this realization that while I had been a good student, I was actually a really bad learner. Okay. And, you know, and now to listen, if, if uh, anyone has watched, it's the most um, most viewed TED talk of all time, the Sir Ken talking about schools kill creativity. You know, that's put so well sort of words to my experience. But at the time, I'm 17, and it feels like a paradox that, you know, I could have been so dedicated a student and, you know, come out of sort of as a result be such a bad learner. Mm -hmm. And I, and, and that just didn't sit well with me. And I didn't like it. I didn't like what the sort of I had turned into, and I didn't like what the system had sort of you know made of me. And so that's what cemented this passion for education. It's like you know, why did this happen? What are the issues? You know, why do we do it this way? Sort of how do we change? And the issues just snowballed. You know, went from high stakes testing to sort of the skills gap and the relevancy of the model and this feast and famine model of. Um, higher education and tuition and student debt and, and these issues just became sort of my life's passion. Right. 
I know that you took uh, when when that cemented as you said that you even moved back to your parents place you just had your firstborn child you moved into the basement uh, I mean these are some of the signals you really wanted to change something and you were willing to give something up you've been in management consulting before so I think there's a clear commitment to the vision so what is Degreed really doing what are you offering what are your services and what are you intending to change with your company Sure. Yeah. I mean, you, you made some allusions there to sort of the, the personal journey. Um, you know, so for me, becoming an entrepreneur was very uncomfortable. I mean, if, if school is good at one thing, it's getting you to follow the rules and fall in line. You know, and, and entrepreneurship is all about, you know, sort of pushing past boundaries and barriers and, and innovating and, and failing and trying new things. And they're very, you know, um, you know, sort of uh, at odds with each other. And so, you know, I came into entrepreneurship really by necessity, not because I was, you know, it, it wasn't in my DNA, it wasn't in my blood. Um, but this passion for these issues has, you know, gripped me and it, it's my life's passion and obsession. And, you know, so I, you know, had to really work hard and, and sacrifice to give myself sort of this self-education of, you know, I joined a startup um, and then uh, we grew that over three or four years. I held several roles, you know, to give me the education of what would it take to, to be able to drive impact on my own and to start something. Mm -hmm. You know, my passion then took me to helping. I joined a team that was launching a university and, you know, sort of further driving my, my interests. And their mission was addressing the cost question in education, which I'm, you know, also very passionate about. Yeah. But for me, Degreed, you know, the biggest question of all, and what I believe is at um, the heart of sort of the equation, is really this question of what it means to be educated and creating transparency around who knows what and giving people the opportunity to transact on all of their education and skills. And the question that the actual sort of driving question that's drove me to start Degreed was this question when you ask people, you know, tell me about your education. Right. They tell you where they went to university, what degree they have, or that they didn't go. Right. You know, but around the world, people answer in relation to their formal sort of academic, you know, education. And, you know, if I asked you, tell me about your health, and you said, you know, I ran a marathon in 1987. Right. You know, that is an absurd answer to that question, not because marathons are bad and not because it doesn't give me any information. It does tell me something about you. But your health at this point in time is such a small function of, you know, the, the fact that you might have been able to run a marathon 15 years ago. Yeah. And yet that's exactly how we answer for our education. You know, we answer with this sort of Herculean event that we did 5, 10, 15, 30 years ago as if it is somehow of really any consequence at, at this moment in time. And so that was the driving passion and interest was we need to create a way, you know, to be able to answer for all of our ongoing education and skills. Thanks very much for that answer. Uh, David, let's make it very practical. So I really want the audience to understand what your technology is enabling each person that is using it. So if, if we, you take yourself or me as a learner, you know, how can I use your technology to learn better, more effectively? What are the options I have? Sure. So, um, you know, what we saw from the modern learner and what Degreed set out to, to help and sort of aid in was the fact that anymore our learning is this journey and it's increasingly uh, a journey across a diverse set of institutions and platforms and providers and modalities. You know, it used to be true at some point that sort of a majority of what you needed to know would be provided to you from, you know, maybe four or five institutions, you know, one or two institutions of sort of uh, formal education and then, you know, three or four employers mm -hmm. and between those, you know, five or six institutions, they would provide you everything you needed to know to be successful. Right. But anymore, 
you know, we now operate in this world where, learn, where we are learning all the time, where the rate of innovation and the rate of data accumulation and the rate, you know, of learning is accelerating and we must, you know, perpetually be learning. And as the web has given us ever more access to better and better ways of learning, we're now learning online, offline, you know, across several platforms, audiobooks, podcasts, articles, YouTube videos, you know, e-learning, um, you know, MOOCs all of these different ways. And as a learner, we journey, you know, from TED to YouTube, to a conference, to an event, to a corporate training seminar. But what we, what we saw missing in the market was while these new destinations of learning were emerging and old destinations of learning were innovating and getting better, there was nothing actually in the market that oriented with you as a learner Mm -hmm. and helped you on that journey across these many destinations. Right. And so right. what Degree does is it is your lifelong sort of home base for learning. Mm -hmm. So we give you a lifelong learning transcript that is able to track all of your academics, all of your professional training, as well as all of your informal learning. We help you discover the best learning resources for any topic. There's pathways if you really want to develop a skill or really go deep on a topic you know, to be able to help have a guided pathway, um, you know, and then all of that data comes back so that you're able to see and track your progress, you're able to set goals and measure yourself, as well as creating social sort of collaboration and transparency, the ability to learn with and from others on this journey, you know, no matter what platform they are learning on, no matter what platform you're learning on, you're able to sort of stay together and learn with and from each other as you go on this journey across, you know, diverse modalities and platforms. Right. So you're stitching together the different islands and learning moments, uh, like the islands of learning and learning moments and environments across all. And we have that all on one platform. And then we can interact with other learners and there will be I think you're also using algorithms to suggest learnings. And I, I would really yes. like to bring in already at that stage, I have reviewed some of the questions that the audience had. And so it's, it's a question I had. And so I want to bring it already into the interview at that stage uh, and to ask you, uh, and you mentioned that learning and the, the, the amount of knowledge is exploding every day. Um, and how can I orient myself to what I should even be learning? I mean, give, are you giving me a guide or how can I determine what my learning portfolio, my learning path, my learning journey should be? Do you have any advice for, for me and for all the audience that is listening or anyone who will ever see this video? Sure, I think, you know, um, it's important to just sort of break apart what we're talking about. You know, are we talking about fundamentally upskilling myself, you know, truly gaining a new skill that I have no exposure to in this moment? Or is it about, you know, in my field of study, in my, in my professional field, you know, staying abreast with the, the latest, you know, innovations and updates and, and ongoings? Um, you know, if you are actually upskilling, you know, sort of gaining something new, then laying that foundation, you know, is super important. Just-in-time learning can't happen until there's sort of a foundation, uh, you know, from which to build. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the best equation I've seen is for people to on-ramp. You know, you can do a lot by yourself. Mm -hmm. Get online and do, you know, online exercises, online courses, you know, gain, watch videos on YouTube or, or otherwise of people in the field. You sort of give yourself, you know, this on-ramp, but then pretty quickly, you know, learning is a, a hard process. Yeah. You know, it's best when it's a social process. It's best when, you know, we're doing it uh, with others so we don't ever get stuck and there's, there's resources to help us get unstuck. You know, and I think getting yourself in a, you know, a great um, course or boot camp or class or training program or, you know, a, online in the best sort of online platforms, surrounding yourself with what it really requires. And, you know, so I think you quickly have to on-ramp yourself to one of those kind of experiences that is in reality going to help equip you. But I think if you talk about just-in-time learning, you know, the problem used to be about how do I find, you know, the right resource or the best resource, and it still sort of is, but it used to be, you know, uh, information was 
limited and finding it was and accessing it was hard. And over time, we're confronted now with the inverse problem, which is, you know, information is abundant and sorting through it, you know, and not getting overwhelmed becomes a problem. You know, and that is a problem that is best suited, you know, by, you know, curation. And yeah. so degree, you know, we've taken several approaches to, you know, um, sort of algorithmically and machine learning, you know, the more you learn on the platform, the more we know and the better we can inform what we bring to you next. You know, we're also social creatures and social curation, you know, remains one of the best ways to sort of stay abreast, you know, following experts in a field and being able to see what they're learning and benefiting from the fact that all of us anymore are sort of these human curation machines. You know, every single day you're out there eyeballing so many links and articles and newsletters and emails and you're passing on some and diving in on others. And you're doing this work of essentially filtering in and out for you personally, you know, and the power of degree is you're able to bring that to benefit others where they're able to follow you and see sort of what you've curated as, as a thought leader, you know, in the field. Right. There's the level of me as an individual who can use your platform. Uh, you also offer your solution to corporates where they can use it to make their corporate learning more effectively. I mean, Peter Sanger, 25 years ago, wrote the book, The Fifth Discipline, on the learning organization. And uh, how much has changed in those last 25 years? Or haven't we come as far as we should have come? And, and what do you see as a next step? And, and how is your technology you know, playing into that? What have you seen? I mean, you have been working with Tesla, with Google, with, uh, with Intel, with others. So what, what can you share from the insights you have on corporate learning uh, versus individual learning that each one of us can can be learner-led in an omni-learning world in some way. Sure. Um, you know, just the industry at large, I think, changed, you know, very little and then all of a sudden. You know, the, the equation for a long time had been, you know, we do our corporate training programs often in person. Mm -hmm. We sort of augment that with some e-learning, whether we develop that or you know we, we partner um, to bring that content um, into the organization, and you know we manage all of it through a learning management system, an LMS, and sort of those building blocks were sort of the fundamentals of every single enterprise organization around the world, and you know and it changed very little, but with this shift. You know the 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 amount of learning that's moved online, and the fact that slowly over time, if we need to learn something, we no longer go to our employer, you know, and have the expectation that they are going to equip us. You know, if you need to learn something, you go to Google. You know, you you just you you know you go to the web, and so over time, you know, the amount of learning that the organization was structuring and providing went from being a majority to being a, a very low minority. And, you know, the amount of learning people are doing on their own is now continuous and all the time. But organizations had no line of sight in any of that. You know, we, we don't have enough data to see that, you know, it's single digit percentages, you know, uh, what you've learned in the last 12 months, your employer administered, you know, two, three, four, five percent of what you learned last year. Right. You know, 95 percent of what you learned last year was, you know, uh, self-driven, sort of on the job, informal, um, you know. And so the big shift that's had to happen is companies have realized that we're spending all of our time and energy against a small fraction of an individual's learning. And, you know, we need sort of a line of sight and leverage and a way to bridge into all of this informal self-directed learning. So, and that's, that's really been the biggest shift in how Degreed has been able to, to come in and help organizations. So I want to, um, because we, are, we, are, um, you know, we don't have too much time, I want to kick out a couple of important questions that also come from the audience in some way and to have, let's say, uh, some quick answers on those. I think one that, that is for all of us, it's on, on the passion for learning, self-motivation, but also in a corporate context, how do you, you know, get people passionate about learning? What's your quick take on that? Um, you know, I think uh, for me, it was really about being unafraid 
and doing it simply for because I cared about it. You know, if you you have to get past this, what others care about, what's going to qualify me perhaps in the eyes of others to, to gain passion, it has to come from within. And, you know, so so sort of whatever it is you care about, be unafraid, jump in. And if you need to, if you are a chief learning officer and you want to enable a whole organization to learn more effectively, and I think when you compare to the fitness industry, those people that are measuring their health are those that wouldn't need to do it because they're usually fit and they are optimizing. And those that are sitting as couch potatoes on the sofa, they are not the ones who are measuring, right? If we take that metaphor to the learning space, you know, you will have those that have a high intrinsic motivation to learn. And then but you have an organization where you want others to learn. How do you instill a passion for learning? in a corporate? Sure, I mean, you, you draw the um, analog to fitness, you know, and, and at this point, there's a lot of studies that show exercise is contagious, that if you have social exposure and people in your social circles exercise, that you too are more inclined and more likely to exercise. And the same is true of learning. But we've actually had very little transparency into what each other learn on an ongoing basis. You know, yes, there are social networks, but the purpose of those aren't, you know, they're social. You know, it isn't a learning network. They've been social networks. They've been professional networks. And by simply creating sort of, you know, a social network for learning and giving that exposure and seeing that everyone around me, you know, is learning, that is a really powerful force in motivating sort of those couch potatoes, if you will, right. Right. you know, to, to also participate. Then there's an issue around... When we talk about learning and you talk about measuring of learning in, in formal and informal ways and there's a whole like who will validate the learning that I do because so far I get a degree from Stanford or from Harvard or from IESE or from, or from the university where you graduate from and that's validated and there's credibility in the market. Now if I have watched uh, a course, I've read an article, I read a book uh, I did certain coding academy activities, whatever it is, uh, and the more technical we might be able to measure it more, but also on the informal learning, who will put a stamp on it and how do we deal with that problematic? Sure. Um, you know, if we are to make lifelong learning matter, informal learning matter, how do you make learning matter? And, and really sort of historically there's been two answers to that question. It either has to matter to universities or it has to matter to employers. And for us, you know, um, if learning forever always has to matriculate into, you know, academic degrees and academic credits, then the world really won't have changed all that much. You know, so we believe that the, the path forward is making our lifelong learning matter in the context of our ongoing careers and with employers. And so, you know, it was important to us and that's really why um, we very quickly launched into the enterprise offering was, you know, we now have these big Fortune 20, 50, you know, Fortune 100 companies that are using degree to be the way that they assess and measure and certify all of the learning and skills of all of their employees. You know, so it's now millions of people across these big global companies and, you know, and we are the ones um, certifying the individuals, but because it is the way that these organizations um, give recognition and credit for skills and learning, you know, it's really, sort of their buy-in that gives it all credence, you know, gives it that, that um, um, value, right. sort of that yeah. currency in the market. So um, we, one thing I wanted to address, it has, had also come up uh, in, in, the, in the chats, is uh, the future of technology. I mean, there's a lot of uh, talk about artificial intelligence, about virtual reality, about augmented reality and all the different things that are happening. We talk about robotics and they will exchange jobs. I mean, what is your vision going forward on a blend of artificial intelligence and our own learning? Could you give us a, a glimpse into the future from your perspective as a CEO of an educational technology company? Sure, I, th I think, you know, we all stand to gain an enormous amount as learners from increased, you know, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Again, sort of, you know, getting the right resource in the right moment in time, getting the right answer to get me unstuck in the right moment in time, 
we will all stand to gain immensely as learners from sort of these advancements. I think as you move to, you know, human capital in the economy at large and sort of the shifts that this is going to create, you know, I think that once again, learning really does become our answer that we have to as individuals, as corporations, as workforce, we have to be agile. You know, we, we have to be continuous learners. Um, I am very optimistic. I'm not one who believes that sort of automation is going to wipe out, you know, entire portions of the labor force that will be sort of, you know, irreversibly unemployed and that we will have to move to basic incomes and, you know, deal with this crisis or the world will go into right. chaos. I believe that, you know, learning is the answer forward, that human productivity will increase. That in, and as long as the world has problems to solve, that, you know, as long as we are good at orienting people to problems and equipping them with knowledge and skills, you know, that we will see a continued up leveling of the of the human workforce. Right. And, you know, and, and so I'm, I'm really quite optimistic as as, uh, as an avid learner. It's, it's great to have an optimistic voice among many that see, uh, you know, a darker scenario. Uh, we are into our last uh, few minutes, so I would really like to give the audience a bit more space here um, and, uh, and look at some more of the questions that are coming from the people who have uh, uh, listened uh, to, to our interview. So if we, if we could go there. Um, uh, so we, we talked about uh, some of, of them. It's like what we said, how to manage learning time. Uh, so many things to do and themes to read is the most voted question here. And uh, I mean, I, I read in one interview that you said everybody should set aside five to 10 hours every week to learn. But again, can you answer that question of how do you manage learning time? I mean, you're incredibly busy as a CEO of a company that has raised 35 plus million, that is 150 people, that has you know, many things going on. So, so how, if, if you could share some advice with us, uh, I'm sure everybody could benefit from that. Um, I love the quote. It, he didn't give it in relation to learning, but Aziz Ansari, the the comedian and, and actor, and his uh, he's he's I think said it in his stand up as well as in his book. But he talks about how the internet, you know, we're all reading essentially infinite pages of the worst book ever, you know, and all too often our time spent online, you know, can feel that way. Sort of, what did it amount to? What did it result in? And and all too often it's sort of, you know it's a guilty pleasure, like it didn't amount to all that much. So I think, you know, staying focused is actually really important. Otherwise, we just get, you know, lost in sort of this web and it can be interesting, but is it valuable, you know, and staying focused. So having a goal, you know, charting a course and sort of working through it is, is the best answer to that. I think personally, you know, um, yes, you know, very busy, um, but you know, I, I had a goal this year. I've read a book every single week in addition to all the learning that I, I do otherwise. Um, you know, I, I typically go to uh, probably about 24 conferences a year. You know, I will take two or maybe courses sort of in a given year. But then it's still a majority of my learning comes from the, the smallest of inputs, the articles, the videos, uh, the podcasts, sort of the audio books. One of the things I have found is actually to learn across um, modality, keeping a physical book, keeping an audio book, you know, having sort of my pathways curated um, that I can access online, offline, because that allows me to learn in every scenario. You know, if I'm on a train, sometimes it's hard to, you know, pull out a, a physical book if I'm standing in a crowded subway, but I can put in my headphones and continue my audio book, you know. Sometimes my battery runs out and having a physical book in my bag, you know, enables me to keep learning. And so, you know, and if you think about your learning in sort of 15 minute chunks, you know, uh, you have a lot of 15 minute chunks, you know, and if you're willing to use them to, to pull something out and learn, you know, you can be learning, you know, uh, much more than 10 hours per week pretty easily. So, so David, we, uh, we both have young kids and, and maybe many in the audience have or will have. Uh, will those kids still have to go to university, should they, or, or will the model be overtaken by, by, by something else by then, by a co collection of micro-credentials or, or something? I mean, should I still sure. work for a business school? What is your take? On this question, what I ultimately believe is if demand for education was static or generally static, that actually universities would get disrupted. I believe that, that they are disruptable and that they would get disrupted. 
Um, but given that the demand globally for education is growing at such a phenomenal rate, mm -hmm. you know, it's a demand curve that sort of is going to absorb everything that gets thrown at it for a very long time. And so because it's not a net zero game, I don't think universities are going anywhere and I think they will have lots of time and space to continue to evolve and innovate, but that we will see very material, you know, um, uh, advances come up alongside university. Um, you know, will I personally send my kids to university? You know, I think um, truly, I've, if they want, if my kids, you know, I want to get to a point where uh, I'm comfortable and they would be comfortable knowing how to navigate through the world without having to sort of lean on the validation of, you know, an institution, a university. Now, do I, you know, I will insist that they are learning, but, but from where and how, you know, I, I'm more interested in um, fostering sort of curiosity um, and sort of that empowerment than I am them checking the right box or getting the right rubber stamp. No, thanks for that. I mean, while we um, could ask a hundred more questions, we need to uh, come to an end. So what I would like as the last questions from you is to give one piece of advice, the best that comes to your mind to an individual learner that is just listening to this or is seeing this to a person in a in a corporation that has to wants to make his or her corporation more more uh, effective at learning or to start it and maybe what we have to watch out to uh, on in the macro picture you know if you, if you look at the big shifts or something what what we might have to watch out to so if at the three levels you you could say you know one advice per per level I think that would be a nice closing in some way or anything that you feel you know we haven't touched upon that we should hear from from you that the world needs to hear uh, going forward on the topic of education so I'd, I'd be very curious to get your, your view on that. Sure so I mean both at the personal level the corporate enterprise learning level as well as as we talk about automation and what's going to happen sort of globally and just at a, at a economic sort of workforce level you know I believe that we have come to a point in time where you have to be excellent at the job you have. And at this moment in time, you need to be excellent at the job you are going to have next. It's no longer sufficient to just be good at what you do. You need to be good at what you do and what you are going to do next. And those things need to be sort of a progression or you know diversified. I think the best sort of overall advice to give learners and to sort of steer towards that end is always have a project. Mm -hmm. You know, it helps with that focus. It helps take this sort of, I'm, I'm swimming, you know, what is it, what, what, to what end is, is all of this learning? It helps focus it, it helps contain it, it helps you see progress, it helps see tangible results to sort of, you know, what you're learning, always have a, always have a project. Right. No, thank you so much for all those insights, for your time. It was uh, great to get your view who's so much at the, at the core and wants to change it. Thank you so much for your passion. Uh, this is inspiring. Uh, we will clearly follow your path uh, and, uh, and try to implement our advice, uh, your advices. And, uh, and I like this idea of, of connecting learners and making everything easier, more effective and measurable. So uh, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you to the uh, audience here from all over the world uh, for your input uh, and questions um, and please stay connected in any way possible and uh, have the best way possible forward uh, in learning and in succeeding. So thank you from Barcelona, Spain and uh, all the best. Bye bye.